going to talk to us about radio astronomy and spectral Right, thanks, Mike. Thanks for coming back, everybody. Um, so, by popular request, I put together a talk for you on radio astronomy, which I did this morning while everyone else was speaking. So bear with me. Um, I actually hopefully do know what I'm talking about with this. I thought I'd start on a light note. This went around, these memes went around for a while on social media. What do my friends think I do back here observing? My parents think, I don't know. Society thinks I do this. Everybody wants us to be Carl Sagan. Um, I want to be, you know, Han Solo and Bashui, and I actually sit to the computer and produce a lot of data. Uh, so this is highly appropriate. The other question I get when I'm at radio telescopes, most people think this is what we do, and this is not at all what we do. Um, this is Jodie Foster in the movie Contact. She actually followed around Anila Sargent from Caltech for once, learning how to act like a radio astronomer, which is really funny because like Anila was very highly respected, very powerful in the astronomy community, very engaged in all sorts of administrative tasks at Caltech and usually wore a suit to work. And Jodie Foster asked her, is this how I should dress? And she was like, no. Um, so there's signed posters and things at Owens Valley from when she followed Anila around. But this is not what radio astronomers do. We do this. So um, most of my graduate work and part of my work since then was using this wonderful telescope called the Caltech 7 meter Observatory. It was on the summit of Mauna Kea. I guess it still technically is on the summit of Mauna Kea, but it's since been closed. Um, many of the North American radio telescopes that work in the millimeter and sub-millimeter regime have recently been closed because most of those resources got funneled into ALMA. Uh, there are a few left, but unfortunately this one is not functioning, though there is a group of people trying very hard to swing the funding to move it to Chile. So we'll see. I signed on to something a while back. Um, the dish is still intact, and all the receivers are in Pasadena. Um, this is me up on the back of the telescope behind this hole with my students, undergrads no less, um, filling one of the receivers with cryogens at very, very early hours of the morning after we had been at the telescope all night. Um, the CSO is sitting on the summit of Mauna Kea. There are a couple of radio telescopes just right down the road at Kitt Peak here. Um, and so there are radio telescopes around the world that we use for astronomical observations. So I, I decided to walk you through tonight how they're put together, how the major components work, and then what we do with them to look for spectral lines of molecules, because this is, after all, an astrochemistry winter school. So the basic radio telescope design looks like this. It sits on a, some sort of podium where it can spin around in circles and it can also tilt. So you have azimuth control, elevation control. Not all telescopes have both, um, but many of them do. There's a support structure in the back. You have the reflector, which is the dish. And then most of them have a secondary reflector, a few Telescopes actually put the receivers up here. Um, and then you have the feed support legs to hold the secondary up there. Um, and then sometimes the receivers are right in the middle of the dish, sometimes they're behind the hole in the middle of the dish, or sometimes there's complicated optics back there to route the light around. So what happens is light comes in from space, hits the dish, gets focused on the secondary, and then goes through the hole in the dish and off to the instrumentation. That's the basic design. Um, something we should talk about before we get too far is the shape of the telescope beam. So this is the light that is detected based on the optics in a radio telescope. So radio astronomers actually talk about their radio frequencies or millimeter or submillimeter light as a beam projected onto the sky. It has this funny beam shape, and there are side lobes with the way that it works out. The main beam is this giant lobe here in the middle, and that's the one you hope you have pointed at your source. Um, <laughs> different 
sizes of telescopes have different beam sizes, and so you try very hard to match the beam to the size of your source. It's not always possible. So there are times when your beam is very much bigger than your source, or there are times when you end up in a telescope where the beam is very small because the telescope's very big, and then your source some of the signal from your source can give what we call resolved out because the beam is actually smaller than the size of the source that you're observing. So you try to pick a facility where the beam can get you what you want with the observations, and if it doesn't, you try to do the math to correct for that effect one way or the other when you're calculating your integration times. Question? Maybe a silly and stupid question. Resolving out the source sort of like a sampling issue? Yes. So if you have a certain size source and the photons are coming from that entire area, if your beam is smaller than that, you're not catching everything. So you're actually losing intensity because you're not actually seeing the entire source. So this is actually, Mike mentioned this briefly. This is, I think it was you. It's a problem with ALMA because the ALMA beam is so small because ALMA is so huge that for sources with extended structure, for some molecules that are very, very extended, you can't see the signal because it completely resolves it out. So you have to account for this when you do observations. Hopefully, you know your source size, which is another issue. Um, so these are a few of the radio telescopes that are around the world. You can see Alma's angle is 0.0012 arc seconds. That's very small compared to the rest of these telescopes. So I'm going to focus on the first part of my talk on single dish, and then at the end I'll talk a little bit about interferometry. So as I mentioned, there are many different ways to set up your telescope optics. Um, you can have a prime focus where you put the receiver right up there where the secondary normally would be. Most of them have a secondary reflector and then bounce the beam somewhere. A Cassegrain focus has it right in the middle of the dish. An offset Cassegrain actually moves it off to the side. Nasmith actually brings it through the hole in the dish and then off through optics um, from off to other elements off on the side. You could have waveguides, you could have dual offset. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can set up your telescope for the the reflection and the optical configuration. All of these have pluses and minuses. A lot depends on the structure of the telescope and where you can actually mount the detector. Um, and so different detectors are different sizes and therefore it dictates based on weight or size as to whether or not you can put it right up against the back of the dish. This is an assortment of pictures of radio telescopes from around the world. Um, <laughs> so. Even though the dishes aren't aligned, I really like this Alma photo. BLA, Herschel, was a space observatory that had a five-year lifetime and was a wonderful seven-millimeter far infrared spectrometer and imaging instrument. This is the GBT in West Virginia, um, the largest man-made steerable object on Earth. This is Arecibo, not steerable, but uh, built into the middle of a crater in a mountain, and you can see it's got a lot of its, I think the detectors are up here, aren't they? There are single people, anybody? Um, these are the two radio facilities on Kitt Peak, managed by the University of Arizona. Uh, this was the CSO, and this is actually the IRAM 30 meter telescope in Spain. So different radio telescopes cover different frequency ranges, have different layouts in terms of interferometry or single dish, different size dishes. Um, all of it comes into play when you're picking what observations you want to do and what facilities are available. You'll notice on these pictures that some of them have metal surfaces and some of them are white. The reason for this is because of this frequency range, radiation can actually go through a lot of materials. And so you can actually coat the dish to protect it from the sun and the elements <laughs> um, and still get good reflection. So skin depth is a really important concept when you're working with radiation in this range. The idea is you have an electromagnetic field with really long wavelength. It hits reflective optics. The thickness of the reflector 
determines whether or not it reflects with high quality or not. If it's too thin, the radiation will actually go through the surface and interact with the material that it's mounted on, and you'll lose power into that substrate. So if you've got, say, a mirror where you ground it with glass and then laid down a metal coating, if your metal's not thick enough, the radiation will get lost into that glass substrate and you'll lose a lot of your power. So you have to worry about skin depth. Um, it gets better at higher frequencies. Um, so for far infrared astronomy, it's actually not too much of a problem, but you still need to think about this when you're picking the coating that you put on your telescope. Um, people that work in the lab, if you ever need to use mirrors for microwaves or um, terahertz radiation, you really have to worry about this. Um, let's see here. So with instrumentation on the telescope, you have what's called the front end and the back end. Took me a while as a grad student to figure out what exactly this meant. The front end is actually the stuff that is connected to the telescope. And the back end is all the post-processing equipment after you route the signal away from the detector. Um, and radio astronomy, the detector is the receiver. Um, so the front end is actually mounted on and operated on the telescope. So you've got your calibrators, you've got your secondary, your optics, your receiver. Uh, and then the back end is the usually the spectrometer, sometimes the down converter for the frequencies that come out of the receiver. Um, all of that post-processing equipment that gets your signal to the computer so that you can analyze it, that's the back end on the telescope. Um, so we're going to start with the receiver because that's the thing that actually detects the light and gives you the information that you need. Um, radio telescopes work with heterodyne receivers or super heck receivers. This is the same premise as your car radio, um, <laughs> except at very different frequencies most of the time. Um, but the idea is you have a mixer, you bring in a known signal, a local oscillator, and you actually take the signal from the sky and you mix it with the local oscillator to have what are called sidebands offset from that local oscillator. So you set your LO in the middle of your frequency range, and you tune the intermediate frequency that mixes with it to put your sidebands where you want to observe spectral lines. Um, by doing this, you actually end up with both sidebands in one shot, unless you play games with the electronics to filter one out. Some telescopes have that, some telescopes don't. And so you have to be cognizant of where you put your sidebands so that you make sure that your line isn't underneath something from the other sideband that's going to interfere with your observation. But we get this whole swath of bandwidth at once. Um, the spectrometer usually is what limits the sideband width, but you can actually tune the LO and the IF and move things around in frequency space within limits. Um, if you've ever been to a radio observatory, you know that they make you turn your cell phone off. The reason is most cell phones are actually in the IF range and can dramatically interfere with the signal on the telescope. The Green Bay Telescope and all of the neighboring facilities are in what's called the National Radio Quiet Zone for this reason. They actually have people that drive around in a truck and hunt you down if you emit RF signals in that radio quiet zone. And they will, one time I had a RF mouse, I forgot and I left it next to my laptop and went to lunch. And when I came back, the mouse was turned off and there was a note on my laptop that basically said, please stop using this mouse. Um, so you have to be careful about mixing with the IF. Uh, one of my favorite grad school stories was, uh, so I worked with Jeff Blake at Caltech. This was during the Owens Valley time before the Karma Observatory was built as a combination of Overo and Bema. And when they built the observatory, they had this huge debate about how to get the data back down to the valley because you could use you know, infrared line of sight or you could downlink it or all sorts of things. But apparently, frequently, outside observers would email people affiliated with the observatory and complain because there was no Wi-Fi on site. 
the Wi-Fi was actually right smack in the middle of their IF. <laughs> and they were always like, think about what you're asking us. Um, yeah, it's an interesting life. All your microwave ovens are in Faraday cages and all of that fun. Um, so, if we go through Hedera's dying receivers then, the way that we make the light that goes into a heterodyne receiver is through electronic generation of light. So some of you have a spectroscopy background, you probably used to lasers. Um, we don't do it that way. We start with RF generation of light, which basically means that we apply um, a field across something that oscillates. So you can actually induce electrical oscillate by applying a voltage or a current to some sort of substrate. And you can actually set up an LC circuit and it'll ring back and forth and it'll give you this oscillating electric field. This is the premise of everything that we use in modern society that's on some sort of time-based system. Um, so your watches, your television sets, um, all of your car radio, all of those things all work off of oscillator. Uh, I'm going to have a lot of information on these slides. I'm not going to go through it all, but I wanted to leave the detail so that if you want to go read, you can go back and see all the details. So whatever it is that the substrate is, if we can apply a voltage or a current to it and it starts oscillating, we can use it as a frequency source. The most common sources in industrial applications for commercial products are crystals and diodes. Um, crystal oscillators are the time basis for pretty much everything that we use in electronics. So the idea is you use the piezoelectric effect, you apply a voltage across some sort of crystal. Quartz is a really common one for things like watches. Um, and so you apply it across that crystal and it outputs if you control the voltage and the temperature of the device, it outputs a certain frequency. And so these are really good for RF applications, not so great for higher frequencies, which is the direction radio astronomy is going. So we use diodes. So you have a PN junction, you apply a current or a voltage across that junction, and you can actually hit a region where it actually starts, you can forward or reverse bias it, and then under some conditions, you can actually get it to start oscillating. And then it'll get, give off an RF field. Um, there's a lot of work in applied physics to try to develop these types of junctions for various applications, depending on whether you're trying to create a signal, detect a signal, get higher sensitivity, uh, faster response time, slower response time, depends on what you want to do. Um, so there's a lot of work in semiconductor junction um, trying to actually develop junctions that give off frequencies that are useful for various applications. So, in particular in radio astronomy, tunnel diodes are really important. And the region is, if you tune them just right, there's a negative differential resistance region in the current voltage curve and this makes it go non-linear and it makes it start to oscillate. So you can actually take these devices and make them output millimeter and submillimeter radiation by forcing them into this non-linear regime. Um, this was first developed actually in the precursor company that became Sony. Um, and it, the man that developed this, Leo Asaki, won the Nobel Prize in Physics for figuring out this tunneling effect and diodes. So these are used really frequently for both frequency sources and for detectors in this range. Um, and the idea is if you apply a voltage across one of these diodes, you can actually make it oscillate and give out radiation. Um, and depending on how you tune it, you can tune to different harmonics and get different frequencies out. So in a lot of cases, these diodes, you put in an input frequency, you put a bias voltage across the junction and it outputs the second or third harmonic of the light that you put in. So this is how we get to higher and higher frequencies based on standard RF technology. Um, a lot of the, this field actually developed out of World War II because of radar development and after the war was over, all that equipment was sitting around and people like Charlie Towns started developing new techniques using all that microwave equipment. 
So the Maser was developed using spin-off technology from World War II radar, and then from there the laser was developed. Um, so if you look at these harmonics, um, you can actually end up using devices that can take you up to very high frequencies. So a Schottky diode is one that's a metal semiconductor junction. They have really fast switching times. You can actually use them to output really high frequencies. So this is a W-band in Virginia diodes, uh, Schottky diode. Um, Virginia diodes started as an electrical engineering professor at University of Virginia named Tom Crow and a couple of his former students. And they were fiddling with a spin-off company named Virginia Diodes, and it was basically like four guys in a shed. <laughs> um, and then they got the contract for all the receivers for Alma. And now it's like 150 employees, and they have devices off the shelf that go all the way to three terahertz, which was unheard of when I was in graduate school. I actually, my research forced us to approach them about building us a, a one millimeter multiplier system, which you couldn't buy anywhere at that point in time. You had to bribe somebody to make you one. Um, and we actually paid the development costs to VDI while I was a grad student to get the very first one millimeter off the shelf component. And now they go to three terahertz, so 300 gigahertz, three terahertz. How much did that cost? I don't remember the price tag, but it, at, for the time, it was very impressive. Um, we needed it. JPL had some devices that they had custom built for spacecraft. Um, if you were good friends with John Carlstrom, you could get all sorts of fun devices that no one else could get. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't something where you could just call up a company and order any of it. It was all custom built until this. Um, I mentioned John Carlstrom, gun diodes are the other sources that you can use for the frequencies. Uh, it's a three-layered stack of n-type semiconductor material to make a negative resistance effect. So this means at zero or low volt voltages, the gun diode behaves as a linear resistor. But at some point, the current stops increasing. You've reached what's called the threshold voltage. And then above that point, the diode has negative resistance. It's really bizarre. Um, but it's a really, really stable source for frequency output in this frequency range. Um, so if you go to a, like I spent all my time at the CSO, pretty much everything was a Carlstrom gun diode. John just like made them for people. Um, <laughs> the big revolution in the field came in the 70s. Tom Phillips, I had to put Tom in here if I'm going to talk about radio astronomy, because without Tom, none of us would have jobs. Um, SIS mixers are the really sensitive mixers that work in this frequency range. These are usually the chips that are in radio receivers and radio telescopes that operate in the far infrared. Um, Tom tells the story that when he was a grad student, they were trying to measure something and his advisor told him that he'd never be able to make a junction that was sensitive enough, so he made this and proved him wrong. Um, <laughs> so the idea here is you have a superconductor insulator superconductor. This is actually a picture of an SIS junction inside of a waveguide inside of one of the ALMA receivers. These are incredibly sensitive. I cannot convince most radio astronomers that we cannot buy a detector from a lab that comes anywhere close to the sensitivity of one of these. They're incredibly expensive devices because you basically have to pay someone to build it for you. But if you can get your hands on one, you have a fantastic detector for a laboratory experiment. So I try. A few people are starting to get them. When they upgraded in Noema, People bought some of those, and I'm negotiating with Caltech to get my hands on one. Um, but they're really good for radio astronomy. So the idea here is you have this mixer, so you bring in two different frequencies of light. So you've got a DC biased SIS junction, which is just below this gap voltage. If you have high frequency signal from the object in space, 
It hits the mixer along with your LO that you provide, and photons start to get absorbed by the junction, and things start tunneling across the junction. And so that changes the curve for the current voltage curve, gets a nonlinear response. You actually get a frequency correlation that's a down-converted version of the signal from space. And so you can actually then send that off to a spectrometer and basically effectively mirror the signals from space. So you have this weird step voltage that you have to tune to. I'm, am I, John, it might be, who else has tuned an SIS mixer? John and I have. Mike might be our only other hope. Have you had to tune one? No. No? Yeah, okay. The CSL made you tune. Everybody else went to auto-tuning pretty early on, but Tom didn't like it because he thought you should do it by hand and make it as good as possible. And so there was a lot of prowling around on the floor under the receiver at 3 in the morning at high altitude in my days as a graduate student. But you were looking for this response, and then you knew you had it tuned. So we have a receiver, we have a mixer, it's incredibly sensitive, we know how to make the LO, we know how to make the IF, we can superimpose them and make the sidebands. So now what do we do? Light comes into our telescope, gets focused on the receiver, goes onto this mixer, and then what? Um, we have to be able to process the signal, and that's where the back end comes into play. So, there are a couple of different types of spectrometers you can put on the back end of a radio telescope. I'm going to go over the most commonly used ones. I'm sure there are more, but these are the ones that most people have. Almost all of them are built in Cologne. <laughs> uh, no. Some of them are. A lot of them are. Where else are they built? Oh, in Sweden. In Sweden? Yes. Oh. Well. The one that I used first, that's kind of the old standard, is called an acousto-optical spectrometer, or an AOS. Um, the idea here is you bring in your RF into a Bragg cell. There's a piezoelectric transducer in the cell that interacts with that signal, and it generates an acoustic wave through the acousto-optical effect. That changes the refractive index in the material in the Bragg cell. So if you bring a laser into this cell, it will get diffracted, and the diffraction angle will actually map onto a spectrum that you can correlate with the RF signal that came off the sky. So if you have a lot of RF signal, it goes up, and if you don't have a lot of RF signal, it goes down, and so you can map out the spectrum based on the interaction of that RF signal with the material in the Bragg cell. So at the CSO, we had a series of lasers in a box with a bunch of Bragg cells, and it was all temperature controlled. This is really temperature sensitive. Only once did I ever get to open that box, but one of the lasers went out, and there were many keys and buttons and things, and I had to have special permission, but we got it back up and running again. So um, the other thing, and probably the thing that's used most frequently now, is some sort of Fourier transform spectrometer. The idea is you can bring in your RF and you can do various processing to it through a Fourier transform. You can record it as a time domain signal. You can do the autocorrelation function and then get out the power spectrum. Or you can take the time domain signal and do a fast Fourier transform and get the magnitude spectrum and then get out the power function. Whichever way you prefer to process your Fourier transforms, it gives you the spectrum in the end. Um, so you can either use an autocorrelator or a fast Fourier transform spectrometer. Um, and these, in my experience, are way more robust and calibrated more easily than the AOSs used to be because they were so touchy about temperature and everything. Um, and they're also much broader bandwidth, so you can get a larger swath of frequency space out of one of these than you could out of one of the old AOSs. So this is the future, or at least the present, in radio astronomy. So, we have our dish, we have our reflector, it funnels it into some sort of receiver, and through an optical path, the mixer mixes the sky frequency, 
and then it comes out of the telescope. Usually it runs through what's called an IF down converter, so you remix and subtract the IF out. And then you run it through some sort of spectrometer, and you get a spectrum, hopefully. Um, <laughs> uh, this is what a spectrum of Orion looks like. I took this with FTS, it's the same. So this is the Orion Nebula, which if you go outside right now, you could probably see it. Um, the fuzzy spot on the sword. This is what it looks like in frequency space. Every single one of these lines is a molecular line. So now we have a spectrum, much like we've seen from the talks this week with laboratory data, except we have every single molecule that's in Orion that has a line in this frequency range all superimposed on each other. So as a chemist, this is really a complex mixture problem. You have to figure out how to identify all of these lines, match them up with the molecules that they correspond to. Luckily, rotational spectroscopy is structure specific, so you can actually back out what's in here if it's been measured, and then you can actually use the relative line strengths to figure out the temperature and the density in the source. So I'm going to walk you through what we do once we get this information. But there's some key points about how you do the observations that you have to consider first. We keep going back to Green Bank. This is a calibration horn called the Little Big Horn. It's huge. <laughs> um, so the idea with calibration is you have to be able to take data on a given telescope and compare it to any other telescope. But they all have their own optics. They all have their own efficiency of getting light through the system. Every receiver is different. And then the other thing you have to worry about is the weather changes. So the sky is different, usually day by day, sometimes hour by hour. Um, so you have to calibrate out all of those effects so that you can actually get your spectrum on a scale that's comparable to every other telescope in the world. So, how to do this? Remember your physics. So, black body radiation. Classically, we can look at the Rowley genus limit and we can actually see that the energy in the system is the Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. At low frequencies, this is the relationship that works. But as you may well remember, at UV, that breaks down. And this is how, uh, using the maximal Boltzmann energy distribution, we actually get to Planck's law of black body radiation. But, as I said, at low frequency, this one works. And so in radio astronomy, we can actually use this limit to simplify the math um, and actually treat objects as black body radiators in the Rowley James limit. So, Antenna temperature is the scale that we're after because if we can get it to antenna temperature, we can get every other observation to antenna temperature and then compare them all. So the antenna temperature is the calibrated temperature, which is defined as the temperature of the antenna radiation resistance. What does that mean? So to determine this, the telescope observes this point source that has a certain flux density, and then you go off of source and you replace that signal feed with what's called a load that's just a resistor that's matched, and then you tune the temperature of the resistor until the power matches what you saw from the point source. So you can actually then use the Rayleigh Jeans law to figure out the measured spectral power, which is just the Boltzmann constant times the antenna temperature. I borrowed almost all of these definitions heavily from NRAO documentation from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. They run a summer school on single dish radio astronomy alternating with interferometry every other year. If you're interested in radio astronomy, go to both of them. Go to the single dish first. <laughs> the interferometry school is going to make a lot more sense if you do the crash course in single dish observations. Um, so I borrowed heavily from this. Karen taught me how to use the GBT, so I know she can be trusted. Um, <laughs> so the other thing we have to worry about is what's called system temperature. So you can calibrate your electronics. You can get to antenna temperature. 
But what is our limit of our minimum detectable antenna temperature? So we got to get down to the system noise, and that gives us what's called system temperature. So you can break this down. You have the antenna contribution, the receiver contribution, and then the power loss between the two. So to get system temperature, you actually have to do an off-source measurement that accounts for everything except your source. And then you do an on-source measurement, and then you compare the two. Um, so your off-source has your receiver temperature, the ground, the atmosphere, which is a big contributor, the cosmic microwave background that we've heard about this week. Um, and so you could go through all of these terms and sort all of this out, but basically, practically, what you do at the telescope is you switch between on-source and off-source and do this calibration as you're observing. So you're physically moving the You're physically moving the telescope. So with the CSO, you're actually attached to the telescope control system. Physically in the dome, you move with the telescope. And so when you do a TCAL, you actually go, <laughs> you can feel it move. And then they went to remote observing, and we were all sitting in my group office trying to run the telescope, and we'd get ready to do a calibration, and everybody would grab their chair, and nothing would happen. It was so disconcerting. <laughs> but yeah, it physically moves the telescope off source. Yes? Not all, not all systems work that way. There's some <clears throat> where the comparison being is obtained by Ah, yeah, you can do it that way as well. But something moves yeah. to look at an off-source position. Yeah. How off do you usually go? Um, you can set that parameter. There's usually a default. A lot depends on the spatial scale of your source. A large, like, yeah, you feel it when it moves, so it's pretty decent. I don't remember what the default was with the CSO, but it was enough to give you a, a ride. You woke up. <laughs> <laughs> So, what we're aiming towards here is what is the noise level in terms of temperature? Because you're going to measure your signal from space in terms of temperature, and you need to know the noise so you know how long to integrate. So, if you measure the system temperature, you can then calculate integration times using this wonderful expression. If anybody's ever going to do any part of your thesis on radio astronomy, this will be etched on your brain by the time you're done. So KS is the sensitivity constant. That's a documented number they measured when they calibrated the instrument. Uh, delta nu is the pre-detection bandwidth. T is the integration time for one integration. And then N is the number of records. So if you're doing multiple repetitions of an integration, you do T times N. So if you take the square root of the bandwidth times t times n, that's inversely proportional to the root mean squared noise of the system temperature. So you can actually figure out how long t has to be, or how many n's you need to figure out how to get t, the delta t RMS down to the level that you need it to be. If you want to have it be a real detection, that has got to be at least three times below the size of your line, or it's not a real detection. So you want your line to be at least three sigma, which is pretty standard. That applies in chemistry and spectroscopy as well. Um, I've seen some two and a half sigma detections where you just went real hard, and it's kind of sort of there. Um, so we want to do spectral observations. You can do a couple of different things. I realized that I made this slide many years ago, and now the top part's almost obsolete. Um, <laughs> so it used to be you could do a targeted observation where you set up your spectrometer, you've got a little bitty window, and you centered it on your line, and you went off to the races, and you got something that was you know, a few hundred megahertz wide if you're lucky. Um, usually the narrow bands were the high resolution. And the bigger the bandwidth, the lower the resolution. So there was a trade-off for spectral lines. But now, because of FFTSs, most observatories actually operate in pretty broadband observing mode. And so you can go across a line survey pretty quickly with most telescopes these days. 
A line survey is where you scan through a whole range of spectral data and construct a whole spectrum instead of centering it up on one or two lines. These things are hard. <laughs> um, they used to take forever. It doesn't take so much time anymore. Now remember, you're observing both the lower and the upper side bands. If you have a facility that doesn't actually mix one of them out or filter one of them out, you could be looking at something here, but when you add in the image sideband, it could end up underneath some other molecular signal. So you have to be really careful about how you set up your sidebands. Um, you can actually play around at most observatories now. They have automated spectral configuration programs where you can kind of put in your lines and it can you can move the IF around and the LO around and figure out how to set it up to make sure that you don't have anything in the way. Um, I did a lot of spectral line surveys in my day and we came up with a scheme because the CSO was double sideband which was actually helpful because we were trying to cover as much frequency space as we could so we got everything all in one shot. We just had to figure out how to deconvolve it. So we worked with the people actually that did the deconvolution scheme for Hi-Fi on Herschel on how to sample across a spectral range so that you could get enough redundancy on a given frequency point that you could deconvolve the image and the frequency sidebands and pull it out. The magic number is eight. You can get away with six, but eight is better. Um, so, we tried to set up our spectral observations so that we covered every frequency at least six times, preferably eight times. It's good in the middle, out on this end. We decided to oversample down here and then just go. And so when we got to the upper end, it kind of depended on what the weather was like as to how far we got and whether we cleaned it up at the end or not. So this was the sampling that we did on Orion to get the spectrum. At the time that we did this, it took us about four days at maximum operation, like we knew what we were doing at the time we did this in four nights of observing. Um, that is quite the revolution compared to what it used to be. Now with only you can do it in a couple of minutes. So it's all relative. But once we get the spectrum, then the question becomes, what can we do with it? So if a molecule is in thermodynamic equilibrium, and if your spectrum, well, if the molecule is optically thin, meaning the radiation can get all the way through the cloud, <laughs> um, you can use what's called a rotation diagram analysis to figure out temperature and density. So this is assuming you're looking at an emission spectrum, molecules in space, um, emitting photons, you can actually integrate, you can go to T main beam from antenna temperature, you just adjust for the source size and the beam size. So the integrated intensity of the line is a bunch of constants over frequency squared times the Einstein A coefficient times the degeneracy times the column density over the partition function times the Boltzmann factor. So if you rearrange this mess, you actually get this equation, and if you plot this versus upper state energy, you can get a slope that's minus one over the rotational temperature and a y-intercept that backs out column density. So if you go to Orion and you take a spectrum and you pick out enough lines, you can do a rotation diagram analysis, you can fit a line to it, and you can directly determine the temperature and the density of the molecules in your source. This used to be the way everybody did it. You did it by hand, one line at a time for every molecule, because you have those little bitty spectral windows. So you would just go and observe one line at a time and piece it all together. Now with the line surveys, that's really hard. Um, but we still do it. So this is out of Yes Jorgensen's um, PILS program on ALMA. And he was looking at glycol aldehyde in the solar type star forming region, and he can plot all of his lines versus upper state energy, fit a line to it, and actually back out a temperature and a density. Um, let's see here, the red, 
The solid line shows the least squares fit to the data, and the dashed line gives the fit for a temperature of 300 Kelvin. So glycolaldehyde's about 300 Kelvin in this source. So you can get decent results, but you'll notice there's a decent amount of scatter here, and this is a pretty good one. Um, so when you look at those surveys and you look at all those lines, you can have lines that are blended, you can have lines that are buried in the noise, um, you can have lines where the intensity fluctuates a little bit from what it should. Usually when you do temperature calibration, it's on the order of 10 or 20 percent in terms of light intensities. And so you have to really take all of it with a grain of salt when you're doing a Boltzmann analysis or a, a rotation diagram analysis. And I know John's going to talk about radiative transfer and what happens if thermodynamic equilibrium doesn't work anymore. <laughs> um, so, to be able to do this and do this well with a line survey, you need a program. Um, so, there are many of them out there. Peter Shilko wrote X Class Magics as a uh, um, extended analysis software to tack on ACASA, which is the data reduction software for Alma. Um, Cassis is also available. Weeds tacks on to Gildas, which is the kind of traditional single dish radio astronomy data reduction package. My group wrote Go Basic, which is actually using a very different approach to the fitting, but the idea is we can load dozens of molecules and let it go off and optimize them all iteratively, and then come back in a week and hopefully have our whole line survey analyzed. <laughs> Um, so depending on what you're after, each of these programs has pluses and minuses. And so you should read up on the documentation and see what does what you need it to do to analyze your observations. Um, the other thing you have to rely on are spectroscopy databases. There are people in the world who work very, very hard to keep us up to date on whatever's out there in molecular spectroscopy. Um, the two major ones are the JPL Spectral Line Catalog, um, started by Herb Pickett, and then continued now with Brian Druin, and the Cologne Database for Molecular Spectroscopy, which is out of the spectroscopy group in Cologne and maintained by Holger Mueller. These two have, one or the other of them will have it if it's been measured and it's interesting for astronomy. They don't have the exact same molecules, because it kind of depends on who has funding to work on the database at that point in time. Um, Tony Rimajan at NREO decided he was tired of going to the two different databases and he needed to make it easier for radio astronomers to understand spectroscopy. And so he wrote Frank Lovis from NIST into helping him and they set up what he named Splatalog. I call it Splatology just to get under Tony's skin because it's fun. Um, Andrew Markwick was working with him for a while, so the British spelling appeared. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Splatalog takes the data from JPL and CDMS and puts it supposedly in a user friendly format, which by trying to make it user friendly made it overwhelming. Um, <laughs> but it's all there. Um, and so you can go through Splatalog and hopefully it's got the most recent update from these two. Um, if you do infrared observing at high resolution, you can also go to HITRAN and pull that information. If any of you have ever wondered if you've ever used a spectral line catalog, it all started with Herb. The reason that things are in the format that they're in is because Herb modeled this off of HITRAN. And so they're using the units of the infrared atmospheric people because he was trying to make it all match, um, which is not so great for astronomy, but we deal with it. Um, how much time do I have? 12 minutes. All right, so if you go to the JPL catalog, it looks like this. CDMS has a really nice, more modern interface now. Brian didn't want to mess with it, so it still looks like this. Um, if you go to a catalog directory with links, you can find molecules there. If you want to go to the browser form, you can just go through the whole, well, I guess the browser form is you put in a frequency range and it gives you everything. The links are individual catalogs for each molecule that's in the database. 
The catalog list looks like this. They're listed in order of molecular mass. So that's what these numbers out front mean. Um, the catalog file is the list of spectral lines here. The .cat file in CDMS is not this. It is this. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> um, so the PDF file or the tech file is actually the molecular information file. And so you can download these and you can get all sorts of good stuff. This is the molecular documentation. So it will tell you who actually contributed the information, uh, what the name of the molecule is, the species tag. Um, it will give you the partition function, a bunch of I'm sure Herb had a reason for picking these temperature values, but anyway. Um, and then A, B, and C rotational constants, it'll give you the dipole moments, it'll give you all the information for what's in the catalog, and then below that, it'll give you the literature information on where they pulled the data. Usually when you send an entry into this catalog as a spectroscopist, Brian or Holger refits your data which makes some people mad, and so they refuse to contribute. Um, many of those people went along with Splatalog because they wanted their stuff used by all my users. So Frank Lopez's private line list is in Splatalog. A bunch of Frank Delucia's line lists are in Splatalog. You can't find that information anywhere else. It's not in JPL or CDMS. But this is what it looks like, and this is what a catalog file looks like which is exciting for teaching new students. Um, <laughs> so I made this. Uh, I put red lines between the columns so you can actually see what is going on. Uh, it's not so bad once you know what you're doing, but you have to have a separate degree in her picket speak to be able to understand it. So these are the frequencies in megahertz. These are their uncertainties from the fit. This is the base 10 log of the intensity in nanometers squared in megahertz, which is the remnants of Hytran because Herb decided it should be that way. The upper state energy and wave numbers, the degeneracy, the species tag, these negative signs out in front mean that it's actually been measured and assigned. If it doesn't have a little negative sign, that means it's just predicted. And then these are the J, K, A, K, C, and sometimes vibrational quantum numbers for the upper and lower levels. So that jumbled mess of numbers actually does make sense. Um, there's some weird conventions in here because he wrote it in Fortran. So if you go over 100, things start getting labeled as A1 is 101, A2 is 102, and so on and so forth because there aren't enough characters. Um, someday someone will make this not be so cryptic. But if you take a spectral line catalog and you put it into one of those fitting programs and you load your observations, you can fit the spectral line information to your spectrum. So these are three snippets of line surveys that I took with the CSO. The top is Orion. Uh, this one, G31.41, is a really rich source. And then 10.47 is also really rich. So you can see we went through and we fit Gaussian lines using the spectral line information to each of these molecules and then trying to do an iterative fit to be able to optimize the whole thing. So if you're doing one line at a time, you go in and you fit a Gaussian, you get the peak height and the full width half maximum and then you run it through a calculation to figure out the Gaussian integrated intensity and then you do the Boltzmann or rotation diagram by hand. In this case, we actually put in all the information and let it simulate the whole spectrum and then do a least squares analysis. So this is where the field's headed. Um, and I'll show you why. I'm not even going to get to the parametry. That was supposed to be next. I love this picture of Alma. Um, so Alma is the next big thing in molecular astrophysics. Alma is in Chile. It has 66 antennas all working together to observe the universe. It is an interferometer, and I'll quickly try to explain to you why we need interferometers. So the idea is instead of one dish with a big viewing angle, you have many dishes that all look at the source from slightly different positions. 
And so you can actually treat this like a slit experiment where you have an interference pattern between the dishes. And if you do Fourier transform map on that interference pattern, you can actually pull out spatial information about the source. And you can also, from that, end up with a frequency spectrum for each point in your map. Um, and so Alma does this very, very, very well. I'm going to skip the fringes. Um, so the idea is you have all of these 66 antennas spread all over the Atacama Desert at high altitude. You have to match the length of cable between each antenna back to the correlator that correlates all their signals. And you have to know exactly what the time delays are so you get everything synchronized. And then you actually record fringes between each of those baselines and then use all of that interferometric data to construct an image. I could teach an entire three-day class on how to do this. Go to the summer school. They'll teach you. Um, but the idea is we have all these different antennas. They run their signals into what's called the correlator, which is a giant room full of computer processors. And then they look at the fringes between each of those pairs of antennas and they back out information. Um, students, you should not feel so bad because today in our casita we had a discussion as to what exactly where the labels UV came from for the UV plane in Fourier transform math and radio astronomy. And it turns out it's just a naming convention, but some of us thought for a while that it was actually UV like UV like UV it's not. Um, <laughs> so you take these fringes in the time domain and you actually do Fourier transform into um, looking at the image in space. And the UV plane is the projection of the observation that should be, you know, part of a sphere onto a flat plane. Um, and then you can take that and you can do various processing with it to be able to pull out molecular information. And this is a really, really, really superficial explanation of how interferometry works, but we're almost out of time. Um, so, if you go outside tonight and you look up and you see Orion, there's the nebula. That's the Hubble image of it. If you zoom in on that and you take an interferometric measurement, you get something that looks like this. So I've color-coded the contours. You get a contour map in molecular emission where the contour peaks are where the molecules peak and then it tapers off from there. So this is methyl formate, ethyl cyanide, and acetone, and Orion. This was concocted from observations from the Karma Observatory, which is also no longer operational. Um, if you look at this with the CSO, you get all of that in one shot because the beam is so big. Um, but what we can start to do is piece together information like this. So this is actually a map of Orion where we took methanol lines and we figured out the temperature at each one of these spots, and we made a map of temperature in the colors. This is in Kelvin. And then we overlay the molecular emission features, and you can see the methyl formate traces the cold gas, and the ethyl cyanide traces the warm gas. So we've started now to figure out physical effects on the chemistry and the source by looking at the spatial distributions. Alma takes this to a whole new level. So, when Jeff Blake was a PhD student, Owens Valley had one radio dish, and he did a line survey using that one dish at Owens Valley, and it took him 27 nights of observations to do this survey. I repeated that with, that's my CSO survey I've been showing you, with four nights of time with more modern equipment. All I can do, not only the spectrum of that signal to noise, oh, I also beat Jeff's signal the noise by a order of magnitude in four nights. All I can do the exact same signal to noise for this full bandwidth with imaging capabilities in about a minute of integration time. So now instead of just having a spectrum, we have a high quality image where every single pixel in this image has its own unique spectrum. All of these features are individual clumps of gas or star forming cores 
They all have their own chemistry. They all have their own temperature. It's a mess. Um, <laughs> I remember the first time anybody ever showed a karma image of Orion, like this, one of mine, I think. Eric Hurst threw his hands in the air and said, I'll never be able to model anything ever again. Because everybody assumes it's all in the same gas. And it's in thermodynamic equilibrium. It is not. Um, so we have a massive data rate problem because it puts out 300 terabytes of spectra a week in images. And so now as molecular astrochemist, astrophysicist, we have to figure out how to interpret data sets like this. Um, so it's really hard to analyze those sorts of observations. And people are making major headway, but I think there's a lot of information that's still buried in those data sets that we haven't even begun to interpret. I laugh and say I have job security. I don't even have to apply for it all the time. If I'm not thinking about my source, it's all in the archive. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, um, but we're unfortunately, because the correlator, the amount of information dumped into the correlator is so massive, they can't keep it all. They actually throw away everything the observer doesn't request because it's too much bandwidth to be able to store it. So, we have a lot of work to do. Um, so, do you guys have any questions? I know it's late and everybody's tired. Yes? Excuse me, this is sound like a really naive question, but since you brought up looking at image contamination from the other sideband, yes. I'm wondering how come you can't match the frequency of the local oscillator to the sky frequency, have an IF of zero, and then not have to worry about looking in the other side of the energy. You can't have an IF of zero because you have to mix with something in the mixer or you won't get a response. So it has to have two frequencies coming in. Or so that's can. what I've heard before. What is the reason for that? Why will you get nothing in? The junction won't happen? respond if you don't put two frequencies in. Okay, so it's an, it's an electrical and yeah. mechanical yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, what a lot of places do is actually have low pass or high pass filters that reject one of the sidebands, so then you only get one, but then you lose half your frequency coverage. So it depends on what you're after. If you don't care about the stuff on the other sideband, use the filter and toss it and then just take your lines. But if you're trying to do a line survey, you want it. <laughs> um, your image rejections too. What's that? Annoy your image rejections too. Yes, very much so. There are also mixer designs where you can separate the sidebands and still retain the full coverage of both. I don't know. Well, so yeah. Without having them uh, overlap or opposed to the double sideband receiver. Right, you can have a pair of uh, mixers that are well matched. So, for those of you in the audience that have microwave spectroscopy training, you're at an advantage over most people because we actually have to worry about a lot of this stuff in the lab. But to the average run of the mill astronomer, they've never thought about this sort of thing before. Um, so it, I had a lot of friends in graduate school that were in other wavelength ranges that would complain about how hard it was to use a radio telescope. They had no idea how it worked or how to set anything up. Um, you do kind of have to know the electrical engineering behind it to get it right, unless there's an operator to do it for you. Some are very large. 
Right. They do some pre-processing for you before you ever get it, which was really controversial when they decided to do it because some people really wanted the raw data, but it's too much. So they run it through an initial data processing pipeline and give you some sort of refined data set. Yeah. So with the capabilities of Alma, like how useful are these other single dish radio telescopes now? Well, it depends on what you're after. So Alma's really good at line structure, but not so good at overall extended source properties. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, like if Alma doesn't cover the right frequency range, sure. or you know, you, you really have to be careful with both the interferometer setup as far as the spatial scales and what the, the spectrometers and the correlator can actually do. So you need both. You really need single dish and interferometry to do it the right way. And the spectral resolution of some single dish is better than our Yeah. Yeah. Like the things. Yeah. Depends on the instrumentation. One of the joys of the single dish observatory is you can move instruments on and off of it all the time. You can't really try prototype instruments on all month. <laughs> um, but like the CSO usually have five or six like user specific, like university instrument development teams with instruments there where they were constantly moving things on and off the telescope to try out their instrument designs. And I know the JCMT did the same thing. They were next door. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of the single mission observatories that are great test beds for new instrumentation. Oh, no, 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 you're more important than I am. Okay. Um, how exactly the services of a single dish telescope need to be? Because they're close to the elements all the time, right? Right. It depends on the frequency. Um, so it used to be in Green Bank, you could walk on the surface of the GBT as long as you didn't have more than one person on a panel. Um, they've since gone to higher frequency, and so they don't let you step on it anymore, which is unfortunate because it was really fun to walk around on the GBT. Um, so yeah, it depends. But like at Owens Valley, I more than once would have to go out and I would tilt the telescopes up and have to go out with a giant broom and drink snow <laughs> off of the dish. Um, Green Bank do snow dumps all the time. You can observe through snow. It's fine. Especially at low frequency. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it depends on the frequency that you're at. And I'll, some of them have systems with laser guided alignment, so they make sure that they keep the surfaces smooth as they possibly can, but most of them don't. Yeah, as a rule of thumb, uh, if you'd like to have the uh, RMS surface accuracy, that is the difference between. The perfect paraboloid in the true surface um, averaged over the whole thing, the RMS sur surface accuracy, of the order of uh, one tenth of the wavelength, mm -hmm. the shortest wavelength that you want to use. Um, so, if you've ever bought optics for the lab, um, like infrared optics, they'll quote them as like lambda over 4 or lambda over 8 or lambda over 12. So, it's usually on the good end of what you can buy for lab optics. Um, a lot of the dishes actually have gaps between the panels that are smaller than that, so you don't have to worry about constructing a whole solid surface out of something. You can piece it together. There's really great pictures of Bob Layton and Tom Phillips trying to get the surface of the CSO dish smooth. <laughs> it took a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, there, there's actually a related question that oh. you, one could ask. <laughs> and that is that uh, not only does the surface have to be accurate, but you have to be able to point and control the, the central axis of the reflector to very high precision, that is to a small, to a small fraction of the primary beam. Right. And so, again, that, that's a tremendous mechanical problem, a yeah. challenge. Daniel. 
So it's more of a comment than a question. The big data that is coming out of this is one of the many transferable skills that students working in this area learn. Not everyone who does a PhD and as John may ask you, physics, astrochemistry, is necessarily going to want to continue a career. And I've known a lot of students in Columbia who have taken their experience in big data and built successful careers in industry, in finance. We do this science because we, we do it because we love problem solving. And astrochemistry, astrophysics is not the only place that they're interesting problems. We can take these skills and go many places with them in our lives. So that's something I want you to always keep in mind. We're doing astrochemistry, but there are a lot of places that can take us. And our imagination is the only thing that limits us as to where we can go. I have friends from graduate school that now work for aerospace engineering companies where they're doing image processing for radar applications. And they did this as graduate students. I have a friend who actually built receivers and actually worked on programming for spectral line data deconvolution from double slide band data, and he now works at Sandia and can't tell me what he does. <laughs> but his other job offer was the uh, electronic warfare division at the Navy. So, um, yeah, I have many friends who've worked on various aspects of data processing for astronomy that are now in informatics fields. This is, this is not to discourage. This is not to discourage the students from no, pursuing their, their dreams. You should pursue your dreams. You should pursue your dreams. But in order to become a data miner, you don't need a PhD. I just well, read an article a while back about a bunch of astronomers who have recently taken jobs at Stitch Fix because they need programmers to write better algorithms. Yeah, one of them's from Columbia. Yeah. Really? Okay. <laughs> but, you, but you don't need a PhD for that. Um, you hope that they're negligible because you've got the main beam pointed on your source. If you're off, they can do all sorts of weird distortions to your observations. No more questions? Let's thank you there again. Yeah. Stargate.